Hello and welcome to my presentation for Pwn versus OSINT Punk 2023 using offensive OSINT defensively. I'm Joe Gregg. I'm the founder, principal instructor, and content developer at the OSINTION. I previously served in the Navy on submarines. Standard disclaimer here, the thoughts and opinions in this presentation do not necessarily reflect those of my employers, past, present, or future. They are mine and mine alone. Our agenda for today, what is OSINT? What specifically is offensive OSINT? What are the sources of OSINT? How do attackers use OSINT? What is defensive OSINT? Some OSINT tools and techniques and a conclusion. What is OSINT? There are many definitions. There are many interpretations. Some are more correct than others, but a lot of people have different definitions. In the past, I had a supervisor that thought NMAP was part of OSINT. He could not differentiate between active and passive reconnaissance. The acronym OSINT itself actually comes from military and government lingo, similarly to OPSEC, InfoSec, Ement, SOCMENT, Red Team, Blue Team, many, many others. I know there are a lot of people within industry that want to do away with the military type of acronyms, and I can understand why, but right now it's still OSINT. To the point I was making earlier, though, we have to factor in that OSINT is passive. It should not be readily detectable. What I'm getting at with that is if you're using noisy tools like NMAP, Metasploit, Nikto, Hydra, the whole list right there, if you're using any of those tools, ultimately what that does is that affords the defenders the opportunity to detect you. And when we are doing OSINT, if we want to follow that whole team color wheel thing that's kind of popular within industry, we would be part of the transparent team because if we're doing proper OSINT, we would not be detectable. We're not the red team. We're not the blue team. Any of those teams, we we basically are on our own team. It's not to say that we don't play with other teams. That's saying that we should be the team that no one can detect. So the layperson definition. OSINT is information that we gather in an intelligence context from publicly available sources. Another thing with OSINT that kind of confuses people is it doesn't always mean free and it doesn't always mean unauthenticated. Sometimes we have to authenticate to a resource and sometimes we have to pay for the resource for the OSINT. I consider publicly available as anything that you don't have to be a sworn law enforcement officer or private investigator. You don't have to be operating under the authority of the military or government. And with that, I also kind of have, I have my financial threshold that I consider to be the point of OSINT, but yours may vary. Yours may be anything that, that requires you to pay. But at the end of the day, what that's referring to is there are some things that are prohibitively expensive. And when I think of that, what comes to mind would be like the fire hose APIs that some of the social media platforms have. Know that some OSINT is shared willingly, such as the case of social media posts or sharing your cryptocurrency address. Some OSINT is shared as part of the cost of doing business, such as the case of DNS or cryptographic uh, transactions on a blockchain as it relates to cryptocurrency. When we talk about that intelligence context, that really affords us the ability to say, is this legal and ethical? It's very easy to do things that's not legal. It's very easy to do things that, quite frankly, is not ethical. How does this further my investigation? Is this within scope? That's the big one right there. If it doesn't further my investigation and it's not legal, it's not ethical, I'm not really going to take the time to dig it out. And quite frankly, what it boils down to is why do I care? I'm going to pose a question to you now, and I want you to think about it for just a moment. Is OSINT offensive or defensive? As you continue to think about that, though, I'm going to present you with this. This is a hammer. Is a hammer a tool or a weapon? It's both. If I'm trying to put a nail in my wall, it's a tool. If you break into my house in the middle of the night, it's probably going to be used as a weapon. But it really depends on intention and also the situation. The same applies for OSINT. It can be offensive, defensive. Quite frankly, it could be neither, or it could be both. 
So when we think about OSINT, what is offensive OSINT? Honestly, it's not too terribly different than defensive OSINT. It's just used within an offensive context as opposed to an intelligence or a defensive context. We can use OSINT to find things like vulnerabilities, password secrets, credentials, contact information, especially if we're doing this for social engineering. Whenever I did a lot of social engineering, I preferred for clients not to give me lists of people to fish and fish. I preferred to get that list myself and I used OSINT to do it. The company layout, that could be the organization chart, that could be the actual physical layout, that could be, do they have cameras for monitoring? A lot of the questions that were answered in the SCCTF fall under this. It also includes any specific company lingo. For example, in the United States, Walmart, they don't call their employees employees. They call them associates, as does Kroger. Disney calls their employees cast members. If you are doing a social engineering engagement and you claim to be someone internal to the company and you send something out saying, hey, I'm sending this to the all employees of Walmart, you're going to get busted really quick, very quickly. You also can learn about their web presence, their IP range, any domains, subdomains, in this case, also their vendors and technologies used. And that is very powerful. And we'll talk about that a little bit more here in a moment. First, let's talk about sources of OSINT. Think about all of the various sources of OSINT that you could possibly think of. It's a long list. But it's literally never ending because things are always coming up. Things are always going away. Some things move from free to freemium or paid. I remember a few years ago, I bought the Pastebin API access as part of Black Friday, only for them to deprecate the API within six months before I really got to use it. We have regulations like GDPR, CCPA, COPA. Uh, other states are doing this. Other countries are doing things similar to GDPR. That's forcing platforms to change the way they do business so they can comply with these regulations. When we're talking about investigating people, they change. I used to put things that were on Facebook that could be seen by any friend. I've since changed that. So now every day I go into my memories and if it's not accessible only to me, I change it to that. If I can't, then I delete it. At the same time, businesses change. Sometimes you have different people in charge of their social media and some people are going to be more open to share things than others. The business may take a new turn. They may go, such as the case of Twitter, from publicly traded to privately held. And we were seeing other companies about to go through this. And then you might go from a company in the startup stage to IPO, and now they are publicly traded. So that's going to alter their tonality that they use when posting to social media and what they put out. Also, here are some sources, press releases. We're talking about businesses. Press releases are golden. They are amazing. I love press releases for that. You have to take press releases as a grain of salt at times because they are based on the company spin. If I'm investigating people, obviously I don't want to find the obituary of the person I'm looking for, but sometimes that can potentially happen. But ultimately, you can enumerate an, almost an entire family tree from an obituary. In the United States, it's not necessarily the case. I mean, having gone through that situation fairly recently with a family member, I wasn't thinking about putting deceptive information out there. I put my normal stuff that I would put that's kind of true, kind of false uh, in, in the stuff that I had to put into the obituary. But in some parts of the world, you have to put truthful information. And that's because the obituaries have to serve as a death notice so that any potential bill collectors or anyone else that the person that passed away was indebted to can attempt to collect that. And that's really kind of what it's for. Social media, that's that's a landmine. 
that's a landmine and that's a gold mine. Depending on which way you view social media, I personally, I am not that big of a fan of social media. If you follow me on Twitter or LinkedIn, you'll know that I almost exclusively post marketing things for my courses with the Ascension. Sometimes I might post some funny stuff, like for example, WWE is having a, an event on Saturday, this upcoming Saturday. And I realized that one of the matches, the same band plays, it's a tag team match, both teams music. And I was like, I wonder who this band is pulling for. The band's already been paid. They don't care. I was just seeing if I could get something stirred up with a storyline. Search engines, that's another one. And with search engines, I can talk about search engines for days upon days upon days. It doesn't even have to be anything relative to the right now. We have all of the search engines that we're aware of. We have the Googles, the Bings, the Yandex of the world, right? But you also have to factor in that there are other regional search engines like Baidu, Parsiju, Mojik, Naver, Pipalika, and others around the world. So depending on where you are investigating, you may need to actually use the other search engines. Then you have the specialized search engines like Halal Google for adherence of Islam during the most holy month of Ramadan. You have Kittle or Kid Rex that is safe search on steroids. You have Amia and Dark Trace that look at dark web and onion sites. And then DuckDuckGo, I know a lot of people in the privacy world are huge fans of DuckDuckGo. After reading their terms of service, I'm not really a fan because I feel that they mislead people. They make it sound like you're getting all this for free, but really they're not. No one is. They get an affiliate commission off of things that you buy based on your search results. So that being said, they also just replay being results. And for a company that can afford billboards in several cities that I've visited, companies can't do things out of the goodness of their heart that long. So really what I'm getting at is if they were more truthful and upfront about it, I would probably be cool with it. Public records and filings, that's a treasure trove. Mapping data, depending on what you're trying to investigate and how, yes. Uh, but then you have various web databases. You have things dealing with vulnerabilities. That could be reading up on the vulnerabilities, such as looking through CVSSs and things like that, or looking for CVEs. That could also be the active vulnerability information. Some of the times that would come from Shodan. That could also come from looking at things like exploit DB that's going to help you construct Google dorks to find particular vulnerabilities. You have things dealing with IP ranges, things like the Whois database, uh, all of the other things like URL scan that deals with IP ranges. Credentials, Dehash is my personal favorite. Intel X is another good one. There are several out there. Some are a little bit shadier than others, to be entirely honest. And then honestly, sales leads. I was just dealing with a situation recently where someone was contacted using their cell phone, claiming to be from the CEO of a company. And the question came up of, well, how are our attackers getting this information? And it's like, I know exactly where it's coming from. It's coming from Rocket Reach. Rocket Reach will publish someone's personal cell phone, their personal email address, in addition to their work stuff. And honestly, some salespeople have no moral compass. And most adversaries, there's some honor amongst thieves, but a lot of adversaries don't have a moral compass either. When we think about social media, that's not, not even always OSINT. There's a closed source element associated with social media. And that is what is associated with warrants, subpoenas, national security letters, et cetera. There are other legal constructs around the world, but basically law enforcement or government can go through appropriate legal channels to get access to things from the back end that you cannot collect via OSINT. It may find its way out if that case goes to court and the court becomes a matter of public record as opposed to being sealed. That's a closed source implementation of social media. And then, of course, you have the lifts, LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, or TikTok, and Snapchat. That's your big ones. But what about some other ones that you could possibly think of? We have the conventional social media platforms that are kind of anti-censorship. That would be your truth.social, Parlay, MeWe, Gab, Getter. And then you also have the video platforms that also subscribe to that same ideology. 
Rumble, BitChute, and Band.Video. Band.Video is an Alex Jones thing. So if you plan on browsing that website, I highly recommend going to the grocery store and buying some tinfoil before you go. But you've got other similar platforms. That would be the encrypted messaging apps like Telegram or Signal. Wicker, you can't create a new account on Wicker and the Wicker personal stuff is going away within a short period of time. So don't really focus too much on that. But then you also have like Wire, WhatsApp. Admittedly, I don't trust WhatsApp because it's owned by Facebook. I don't care if they're running the Signal protocol or not. If there's a way that Mark Zuckerberg and company can find a way to subvert an algorithm for the purpose of getting more data to sell to the advertisers, they're going to do it. And then you also have three months. With the news sites, you've got your real news and your fake news. We could talk about that for a long period of time as well. When we talk about publicly available databases, that's going to be things like SEC Edgar for publicly traded companies in the United States, the Federal Election Commission in the United States, FEC.gov. I've had a lot of success in investigating LLCs and high net worth individuals by looking at the state level Secretary of State websites for their LLC findings. In the United States, there are four states that don't require you to be verbose or overly truthful about what you put out there. That would be Nevada, New Mexico, Wyoming, and Delaware. A lot of large publicly traded companies are registered in Delaware for that reason. And then a lot of privacy folks are registered in New Mexico uh, for that same reason. For things dealing with court, you have Pacer, Court Listener, Judy Records, for election data, that could be campaign contributions. That could also be voter registration. That would be the state election commissions in the United States. It varies from state to state. Some states you can query fairly easily. Some you have to provide a social. And I'm always hesitant to do that particular search if I have to provide parts of a social or a date of birth because I'm not a lawyer but I see where it could potentially be argued in court that that is a form of authentication. Thus, doing the search may violate Computer Fraud and Abuse Act and then create a big problem there. With the data breaches, you've got things like Dehashed, Intel X, Have I Been Pwned, Little Sis, and Open Corporates are really good for looking at some businesses as well. With search engines, there are a lot. They all have their own version of dorking. It's the, they have their own way to ask the questions because within OSINT, it's not what you ask, but it's how you ask it that is important. To that same end, you have just a short list here of Google, Yandex, Bing, Gamuru, Metagur, Gigablast, and then regional search engines like what I mentioned earlier. I've put the three that I prefer in bold. If I'm doing a reverse image search, I would probably say Google and Yandex, depending on if it's a person or landscape. But either way, Giburu is really good, and Metagur actually does a metadata search. I found some things that are a bit puzzling there. Speaking to the Google ecosystem, these are what I consider to be the most effective dorks. Site, that's going to limit it to a particular site. You can also use related to potentially find subdomains partner organizations, or competitors. In-text is my absolute personal favorite, hands down, because it allows me to focus and cut out so much erroneous noise. In-title can be good, as can in-URL, depending on what you're looking for. If you're looking for, say, keyhole markup language KML files used within Google Earth, you can use that dork. That last one, you, you cannot do it by itself. It has to be combined with another dork or another search parameter, but that can help you find unique file types, not just PDFs, not just security.txt or robot.txt. And then, of course, you've got the whole Google hacking database that's going to help you find vulnerabilities as well. Attackers using OSINT. Why do attackers use OSINT? Well, information gathering ahead of social engineering and data harvesting and hoarding. Hmm. Why might that be interesting for an attacker? Information gathering, honestly, why do we gather it? It's the context for the contact. From a social engineering perspective, when I did social engineering a lot, I needed an excuse 
to have a conversation with someone, to build rapport with them. Honestly, why do you want to burn a Windows exploit on a Mac or Linux environment? More and more organizations are going all Mac workstations and cloud first without Active Directory. They're using the Google ecosystem. And for that, you may have three or four Windows hosts that you might be able to find some stuff with, but honestly, they shouldn't be internet facing anyway. Who are you going to ish? Fish, vish, or smish? If you're like me and prefer to make your own list, you need to know how to populate that list. So information gathering in OSINT is going to help you with that. Why risk detection very early on? If you have an adversary that is seeking to do more technical exploitation in the world of signals intelligence or offensive security, whether it be a nation state or just a crime group or just some bored teenagers in their parents' basement, why do you want to risk that detection so early? Because with Nmap, it makes so much noise. Almost every single security appliance has a detection for it. It's just a matter of is there anyone on the other side monitoring it? Sometimes there are, sometimes they are not. Why even touch a website? If you're using Google dorking and querying external databases, you can build a pretty good picture about an organization without even touching their architecture. So let's put my social engineering hat on for a moment. Kind of go with some of the stuff from my book, Practical Social Engineering. Shameless promotion there. And let's see what kind of trouble we can find ourselves in for the social engineering perspective. So what about subtle things that can make you and break you, right? As I mentioned earlier, what's the lingo at a company? What are our employees called? Can you find out about some employees that are retiring or managers that are retiring? The true adversaries don't wait for a list of people to fish or fish. They build it themselves. They find out who works where, LinkedIn, Facebook, all the social media platforms, press releases, Google dorks, all of that. Then they figure out what the email address syntax is, or they just find email addresses themselves. And then they go to find phone numbers. And then they may wait until the middle of the night, or they may just block their number and start calling around an organization. That's if they're going to be a little bit more on the advanced side of things. Data harvesting. Adversaries are hoarders too. We see a lot of people within the OSINT world hoarding a lot of data quite frequently. And adversaries are no different. Even if they're not going to make use of data breach or encrypted information, why not collect it? Even if you can't decrypt it right now, doesn't mean that you can't decrypt it later. You might get access to a more powerful system. Someone may find a way or a flaw in the crypto system or the implementation. Computing resources are advancing. I've been hearing stuff where people are talking about quantum computing is here. I'm not sure I agree with that quite yet, but the point being, people that have been hoarding this data now will have a better opportunity to make use of that data. And honestly, with adversaries, going back to that honor amongst thieves thing, Someone is likely willing and able or gullible enough to buy it. Simple as that. Defensive OSINT. Hmm. What about defensive OSINT? It comes in a variety of flavors. When I think defensive OSINT, in addition to threat intelligence as a whole, it also includes attack surface monitoring, ASM, bug bounties, and threat modeling because there's a lot of philosophy that goes into this that we're going to see at the very end from Sun Tzu. You know, it wouldn't be an intelligence infosec or OSINT type talk without a mention of Sun Tzu. But with that being said, how can you protect what you're unaware of? And we're going to focus on three particular disciplines here. Proactive monitoring, identifying potential threats, and protecting assets. So when we talk about proactive monitoring, honestly, it's not going to monitor itself. I don't care what the nice person said for the hefty commission and a logo. And yes, I have recently heard salespeople using the term logo while on a call with a prospective logo. No. Teams don't always communicate well. 
And sometimes you don't necessarily have, they may mean very well, but they may not have the processes and procedures in place, or there may be a flaw with the process and the procedure that affords an adversary the ability to step in and cause some serious mayhem. Sometimes InfoSec and or the SOC are out of the loop in decision making. Sometimes they just have to, and I quote, grin and bear it. They have to do whatever needs to be done, and they basically do what they're told, and they have no seat at the table. And then, of course, using some buzzwords here, what about that shadow IT? What about that developer running a hosting company off of corporate infrastructure? What about the people that just had to, quote, make it work? One way to accomplish proactive monitoring is via ASM. And there are some as active aspects of ASM that are still intelligence, but not technically OSINT. That being said, if someone else does those active techniques and then open sources the data, well, guess what? It's OSINT now. In map, I said before, it's not OSINT, but if you can construct a Google dork that, I don't know, is looking for the word in text for scan results or in map, and file type nmap or gnmap, maybe you can find some nmap scans on Google. There are several vendors in the space and a lot use OSINT or OSINT tooling. Some even have OSINT offerings. Security Trails, Shodan, and a lot of the Threat Intel vendors are doing this now as well. In fact, Security Trails was acquired by Recorded Future. When we think about proactive monitoring, honestly, we need to look at this holistically. And I call this the proper aspects, but your mileage may vary. It could vary in or out of your organization. So you've got to factor in that this is independent of that SOC monitoring type of discussion. We're not talking about that side of things. That's monitoring the here and now. We are trying to monitor the future. That's why it's proactive. So we want to keep an inventory of assets, whether it be internal or external. Obviously for ASM and OSINT type things, we are looking for things that are inter internet connected, which will be cloud instances, web servers, and that type of stuff. It's a good time to find shadow IT and imposters as well. You can always use your friendly neighborhood asset inventory system that is Shodan. It can also assist you in understanding costs and budgets from tool and license usage. This is a way to sell this idea to management. You can also have some level of vulnerability tracking and management in it as well. If you know that, say, you use Apache and you know you use a particular version of Apache, you can construct dorks, then set up Google alerts to alert you if anything pops up. So if anyone restores to a bad configuration or something to that effect. But you should also include a knowledge base about your particular industry, your region, and any other situational factors that could potentially attract threat actors. If you're working in the fintech or cryptocurrency space, I'm sorry, but you're a target. If you are working in healthcare, you could be a target. If you're working in defense, you are a target. If you have a pulse, you are a target. You may not be as big of a target, but you are a target to someone. When we talk about identifying potential threats, we also don't wanna look necessarily at the threats themselves, because that's getting a little infosec heavy. We want to look at the pain and pinch points or any particular bottlenecks. And this can relate to technology, people, or processes. This is typically seen as a SOC function, but in some cases, it's better suited for threat intelligence using OSINT techniques. That's why a lot of the threat intelligence courses that you see have OSINT as part of the course curriculum. You should also consider the use of deceptive technology, whether that be honey pots or canary tokens or honey anything, honey networks, honey documents, whatever. And applying the concepts of a friend of mine, Winch Forteau's book, Time-Based Security, basically he says you don't need to be Fort Knox or NSA level when building your defenses. You only need the minimum amount of defenses to contain attacks until you can detect and respond. And that's regardless of anything any market analyst or nice salesperson tells you, again, for a hefty commission. The TLDR of this is, quite frankly, how can you protect something you're unaware of? You're not a mind reader. 
to be an intelligence analyst doing threat intel or OSINT, you have to be a little bit clairvoyant to look to the future a little bit and understand what's going on. But at the same time, you cannot be expected to have a protective posture over something that you are not aware. Now, we're up to the tools and techniques. I don't want to disappoint you too much, but I'm not really going to talk about tools too much. If you want to use tools, your standard OSINT tools of Recon NG, the Harvester, Spiderfoot, and Multigo will work. I want to focus more on technique. And when we talk about this, you don't have to be overly complex. You honestly don't need any specific tools to accomplish this. You might need access to some things that you do need to pay for. And I try to spell out a price range as I talk about these things, but it could vary. And you want to make sure that you are able to understand that you could build custom tooling with the API access, but most of these, in fact, all of these, you could do from the browser as well. And quite honestly, don't forget about Google, other search engines, and the Google Hacking Database. So with Shodan, that's going to give you insight based on the ASN, autonomous service number, could be the IP range, the host name or domain, and then also fingerprints associated with SSH and TLS certificates. And then there's a lot more. Looking at Shodan, this is the Shodan filter reference right here. And with this, we can see all the things we're looking for. To get to this on Shodan, click on developer. When you get there, click on API reference and then select search filters. So from here, you're able to look at all of these different things. So you can even look at port, operating system. Here's some Bitcoin things. That's not dealing with looking for Bitcoin addresses. That's looking for Bitcoin miners. So to do a search on Shodan, I'm just going to look for the Ascension. And here we have the Ascension wiki. So looking at this initially, we see the host name. We see where it's hosted. We see a little bit of other information about it. It's got Google Analytics on it. It's got a Google Tag Manager. It's a cloud resource. I'm using Let's Encrypt. There's the IP address. So let's dig in and see what else is going on here. Again, DigitalOcean. There's the ASN. We see these two web technologies, and then we see these ports. So in this case, it's blocking port 80 for HTTP. Here's the certificate. We can go here and we can find any other instances of this that could be based on several things here. So you've got key identifiers that you could use, various aspects that you could search for on this. The serial number specifically, absolutely. And sometimes people are lazy and they use the same HTTPS or SSH certificate across multiple hosts or multiple hosts go to the same exact web server. That's something to be aware of with Shodan. Shodan, you can pay for membership and get some API access and some additional access. You can create a free account as well, but you get limited API credits with a one-time fee of $49. You can do additional tiers. They range from $69 a month to over $1,000 per month. Next, we have security trails. This is very DNS-centric. It's based off passive DNS data. It's going to give you information about subdomains and DNS history as well. I like the Security Researcher Toolkit. It's $99 a month. It's beyond sufficient. You can do a lot of this stuff with a free account there as well. So moving over here to Security Trails. So this just shows the stuff for the Ascension. So there's Cloudflare, Mailgun, ProtonMail, SPF records, verifications. So this is what is current right now. I like it for historic information. So you can look and see when things have changed. There was three days in 2020 that there was nothing populated here. And during that time, I believe that's when I was changing from one CDN to another, to be entirely honest. But you can see in 2020, there was a while that the Ascension was using Google. With the text records, you can see when things have been onboarded as well. Onboarded or offboarded. 
And then subdomains, same thing. So there's Academy, email, and eh, Tidbit, Jupiter. Some of these, some of these are a little bit more legitimate than others. I know how they got them. They are not necessarily all entirely valid. And that's from security trends. Dehash, I love dehashed. It's going to give you data breach information, and you can also do who is data. You do have to pay for access if you want to see the juicy stuff. That ranges from $550 for one week of access to $180 for one year of access. With the API access, you're paying on a per query basis. And the same exists for who is data. So if we look at this here, we're going to search for notify at twitter.com. This is the re no reply address that Twitter uses to tell you that something's happened. So in this case, you can see where some people have used this as an email address. There's a raw password. We see what breach it came from. We'll scroll through some others here. So this is uh, sit zero day. We have a password hash here. I don't know if dhash attempts to crack it, but I always tend to copy the, the hash and try to put it in crack station to see if it can be readily cracked. If that doesn't work, then I might go as far as to put it in something to the effect of hashcat. Right here, we see this person is in China specifically in Beijing, but has a San Francisco phone number. Hmm, that's a bit interesting. Here's some stuff from Ole Miss.edu. So U55 or USS Germ. Hmm, that seems a bit off as well. And with this one, this is a public facing address. I'm not the only person that hands this address out to get people off my back but that's just the case in point. With who is, we go here to who is tools. I am using tools that I've paid for here. I'm just gonna go for the who is history and we're gonna go big or go home because regardless of how big of a domain we look for, it's still going to be the same price. It's gonna be 25 credits, which equates to a dollar every time you do it. So right here is the current who is stuff for Twitter. In terms of the smaller domains, in terms of finding stuff that actually lists people's email addresses and phone numbers, those days have kind of since passed. We can see that Twitter's address has changed. They started out on Folsom Street, now they're on Market Street. But we have phone numbers here. These phone numbers could be useful, even though they're from over 10 years ago. There's where they moved to Market Street. And so on. So it's pretty easy to work with in that particular regard. And for the who is, if you want to purchase it again, you once you have an account on here, you go in, you say you want 100 credits. All right, that's $4. So it's four cents per credit. Built with. This is another hidden gem because it gives you insight based on technologies, tech spend, if there are any Google tracking codes, the people associated with it, content distribution network, sometimes vendors and providers as well. Honestly, if you've got a lockdown version of Firefox like I do, it will not work because it will not load CAPTCHA and you cannot complete your logon. Price-wise, the cheapest plan monthly is almost $300. For me personally, that prohibitively expensive territory. But for this, we'll just search for the Ascension again. With this, if you've ever signed up for one of my training courses, you know that I do use Acuity scheduling for that. I have embedded tweets on the website. The Ascension has Keybase. There's CAPTCHA there. It's behind Cloudflare. You can pay using Stripe. There's verifications for all three of these uh, domains. ProtonMail, MailGun, MailChimp. We saw all of that before. 
Let's encrypt in Cloudflare as well. IPv6, that's just because of Cloudflare. But we scroll up here and we can see, in this case, a detailed technology profile. So we see when it was first detected and last detected. With these, don't bank on this being entirely accurate all the time. Because, for example, some of the things it says that are no longer in use, I know for a fact are still in use. So just be aware of that. We also see subdomains over here. So this has some that the others didn't. Meta profile, this is where you're going to find the contact information. So there's nothing that is listed publicly. I've done a good job there. And then right here is the social links. Yep, I totally agree with that. I don't agree with that technology spin, though. In terms of relationship, this is just neighboring IP addresses, so you can potentially find things in IP ranges. In this case, none of these are related in any stretch of the imagination. With the redirects and recommendations, these aren't working. And then with the company, we see there's the domain. And then it, the address is in Canada. I don't agree with that. But hey, it's disinformation. Annual technology spend is about $10,000 a year. That may be accurate. It says that it's on an increasing scale. That could be accurate. I'm not entirely sure. But this is what we have. Wapalizer, it's a lot like Bitwith, but it's a little bit more condensed. You can get the plus plan for $90 a year. Everything else starts at $150 a month. So with Wapalizer, see right here, I'm on the plus plan, but this is the pricing for it. We go over to Wapalizer. Do the technology lookup. So we see a lot of the same stuff. Ooh, welcome to Black Hole. Whatever this was spidering got redirected somewhere. Some of my deceptive technologies are working. You see all this other stuff here as well. It's not as thorough as built with, but at the same time, it's not as overwhelming either. And then you see some stuff with some of the keywords here. I don't know if I agree with all of these either, but it's good disinformation. So we have all of this, and there's literally only one page that we have for Wapalizer. That makes it very easy to comprehend, and it's very easy to digest. Conclusion. Start the conclusion with some art of war. If you know the enemy and know yourself, fear not the result of a hundred battles. If you know yourself, but not the enemy... Every victory gained, you will also suffer a defeat. If you know neither yourself nor the enemy, you will succumb in every battle. In conclusion, you cannot fully defend if you exclusively maintain a defensive or defender mindset. You've got to put yourself in the shoes of the attacker. Coming from the side of social engineering, to a degree, you kind of have to exercise sympathy and empathy for an attacker Put yourself in their shoes and think about it from that perspective. Not to say that some of the frameworks like critical security controls and some of the other things aren't valid. They are based on one perspective. When you look at the OSINT stuff and the stuff that's a little bit more silent, you have a much better chance of being able to hide in plain sight and find things. This is not one and done. You do have to coddle it and nurture it. You do this, and then you let it slide. Things are going to find their way back on the internet. This is something you need to maintain on probably, ideally, a monthly basis, but no less than quarterly. If you'd like to contact me, I'm at C underscore 3 Joe on Twitter, Discord, and several other platforms. The Ascension is at The Ascension. There's a link to Practical Social Engineering on No Starch's website as well as my LinkedIn and other links for the Ascension.
If you're interested in on-demand training, I have three available courses right now with two others on the verge of being released. I also have bundles, webinars, and replays of live streams and a lot of free content there. Visit academy.theoscension.com. If you'd like to purchase individual courses or bundles, you can do so at theoscension.com slash courses slash store. If you want custom bundles or have questions, you can email bundles at theoscension.com. This is the upcoming course list for the Ascension. We're going to be teaching no more than eight hours per month, at least for the next three months. We'll be teaching two four-hour classes in May, a six-hour course in March, and an eight-hour course in April. If you'd like to sign up, that is my bit.ly domain for redirecting these types of things. If you'd like to bundle them, you can do so. I even offer a payment plan. You can follow The Ascension on Twitch, YouTube, and then we just launched a podcast as well. So using that redirect domain again, simply osent.mobi slash whatever you're looking for. Twitch, YouTube, podcast, whatever. We also maintain a couple of communities. We have Discord server, osent.mobi slash Discord, and then we're members of OSINT Intelligence, which exists on LinkedIn. And that's osent.mobi slash OSINT Intelligence. Questions, feel free to put them in the comments section or DM me on Twitter or contact me on Discord. Thank you for your time and for watching this.